Well, it might not be a surprise to many of you that I've been involved in several church communities over the past, well, I don't know how many years now, and not just within the Anglican family to which we belong here, Saint, the Church of St. Mary and St. Martha, but Baptists and Orthodox and Free Church and Catholic and like all over the map. I've, I've been involved and been shaped by the Holy Spirit through a lot of different communities. And there's, uh, there's quite a few things that are consistent amongst communities of faith. Namely, we worship Jesus and we believe him to be Lord and Savior. Uh, but there's a, quite a few things that unite us. Um, but there's another negative thing that unites us as being part of not just the church, but the human family. And that is conflict and sin amongst ourselves. Um, I've seen, like many of you have seen, gossip uh, triangulating, which is uh, involving a third party and in, in, in passing along information when it really should be two people speaking with one another. Uh, like, for example, can you tell Pastor X that someone said Y, that type of thing. Uh, and one church I was been a part of had a lot of issues when it came to conflict in an unhealthy way, uh, where, where there were uh, accusations being thrown about that it wasn't happening in a very mature way and it was really being harmful to the ministry so they instituted a covenant which is based on the passage from Matthew 18 that we just heard read and there's actually a lot of churches that have used the same principle directly from scripture from this passage Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 20 and Jesus says this if your brother or sister sins go and point out their fault just between the two of you if they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So that's a portion of that passage. So in the, in the context of this church I was referring to, what this meant was, the practical application of this was, is that there was going to be no reading of unsigned critical letters, no reading of it, uh, there's, if there's a direct, if there's a complaint to be made against somebody in leadership, that that person needed to go directly to the source, to the person with whom they have that issue. Uh, and then if they needed help, they could get that. So this, these sorts of practical um, implications of this passage had a huge impact on the ministry of that church. It, it really freed things up, it cleared things up. So there wasn't a lot of back channel talking and, and gossip in the same way. Well, everyone who reads this, whether we're part of the church or not, can see the practical advice here. And we all know, we all know how difficult conflict is and how easy it is to do things like gossip. But even with this solid, grounded teaching from Jesus that transcends time and culture, still we struggle when it comes to sin, which is a, a, a hurting of one another, a, a hurting of God, of uh, separation of a selfishness we still struggle with this in the church there is gossip people do hurt each other and there is triangulation uh, and as canadians generally we are conflict averse which means that we we just don't like conflict very much and we don't want to call anyone out on the way that they have behaved or sinned against us and having practical steps to work through this does make a lot of sense however with this particular passage maybe there is much more to this teaching of Jesus than initially meets the eye. There is a part of our passage today that we can gloss over because it's, it's just so difficult to make sense of or understand. It's, it's hard to get the magnitude of it. It doesn't seem so practical like the first part does, like the one I just read. What I'm going to say is hard to connect with everyday life. It's when Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Now, why would Jesus start with such real practical uh, advice that transcends time and culture, and then have this portion at the end that's really hard to connect with. Well, today, in our t we don't have a lot of time to explore the incredible depth of those words I just read, but we can say that when we are dealing with conflict, 
we're not just trying to fix a problem. We're not trying to have individual people feel better. That's not the point. As, as important as those things may be, what Jesus is saying here is that when we, when we deal with conflict, that heaven gets involved. It's not a maybe, but heaven gets involved when we deal with sin amongst ourselves in the church. Heaven is motivated and moved to act. That heaven cares deeply about what happens here. I want to tell you a little story. Uh, a few years ago, late at night, when the whole family was asleep, I'm awake in bed and thinking about all kinds of things, and I'm struggling. I'm struggling with a thought, and to be honest, I can't even remember what that thought was. But there was a real temptation towards selfishness in that thought. I remember that. Now, it's, it's hard to describe this as I struggled with this uh, prayerfully, but it was like I was given a window into a very different place. I could actually hear, this may sound strange, but I could hear the sound of cheering, cheering for me from some other place. But it wasn't a physical sound, I just, but I still heard it. I just knew that there were somewhere people or persons that cared about what I was thinking about in that moment. Even though of all the mountain of concerns in this world, and, and, and honestly, the mountain of concerns in one human life, that this particular thought, I was given a window that there was a place that really cared about the struggle that I had and was cheering me on. Listen to this. Jesus told his disciples a parable um, and people that were sort of listening to him that day. He told them a couple of parables. I want you to read, uh, hear this. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who, was, who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, Jesus says, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, Jesus says, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I thought of this passage as I struggled that night to turn myself to God in my thinking and was granted a window into the reality of the interplay between heaven and earth when it comes to sin and turning from that sin. Now, I don't think we consider this very often, my friends, those of us who call ourselves Christian, but Jesus calls those who follow him citizens of that place, citizens of heaven. And he does it often. Children of the kingdom of God. Now we are granted through faith in Jesus Christ a unique dignity and spiritual authority, a calling to be ambassadors of that kingdom here on earth with all the spiritual resources to help us to be shaped in the kind of citizens that that kingdom calls us to be and to serve in a way that resonates with a servant heart and a character and life of the king of that kingdom, who is Jesus Christ. Now, this is a, a beautiful and weighty and humbling and supernatural and very precious, very precious and very special calling. So special that the love of God seeks us out to the very limits of life to bring us in. The God we have leaves the 99 to find that one lost soul. He sweeps the house from top to bottom until he finds that one lost soul. So we matter that much to him. And have you ever thought of yourselves in those terms? So we turn back to conflict. We turn back to our passage. Again, conflict is real. We live in a very complicated world. We have complicated and competing desires within us. And we find ourselves doing things 
from time to time that we wish we hadn't. We sin against people, people sin against us, and it's hard to sort out real motives from false, how much our emotions and our thoughts are telling us the truth or how much those same emotions and thoughts are misleading us. Dealing with conflict, especially when it's against us, takes an enormous amount of discernment and patience and thought and consideration. And it helps so much when we step back and we understand that to Jesus, this form of conflict is not first about feeling better or even dealing with the problem, but it's about the heart of God that seeks and yearns and goes to the ends of the earth to draw lost people into his kingdom. Verse 15, once again, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. So this calls us to exercise restraint. So don't firstly go and tell a bunch of people, Johnny did this to me, can you believe it? I'm gonna track him down and tell him, are you with me? No, the first step is to think it through, to pray it through, to get a handle on our emotions, to go and tell them yourself. Stop any chance of gossip or slander from spreading and infecting the community. And then verse 15, if they listen to you, you have won them over. So again, what is the business of God on earth? Why did he come in Jesus Christ to die upon the cross? He came to win people over, to gather people into his family, into his kingdom. So as ambassadors and citizens of this kingdom, we are doing the same thing. Here, and here's a key part of our discipleship as Christians. We do not fight the way the world fights, not anymore. We don't first seek out justice for ourselves. Our motivation through the help of the Holy Spirit is to desire to win people back to Christ. Now, the astounding thing is that the key way that Jesus does this is through forgiveness and reconciliation. That's the first vehicle. Now, I know that my wife, Ruthia, loves me. I know that. And, and you know how I know? Well, it's not because she makes me and my kids this incredible food, which, of course, I hope she never stops as she listens to this now. I know she loves me because I know that she accepts me and forgives me. That's how primarily I know that she loves me. Now, perhaps the most powerful facet of true love is that we know it, we're humbled by it, we're transformed by it when we are accepted as we are warts and all, and we're forgiven. We know that we're loved in those moments. So when you approach someone who has hurt you with a desire for their spiritual good, if they listen to you, Jesus says, you have won them over. And when you win them over, heaven cheers. You know, heaven rejoices. It cries out in joy. The boundary lines between this world and that heavenly world becomes very, very thin. The economy of heaven is structured by love, and that love seeks out the lost to the very end. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, Jesus says. Now, I want to say that there are some things that are so hurtful, that are so wrong, that the right thing to do is immediately involve other people in this. In the case of abuse or other sins that do violence on human dignity against the self or against others, there's accountability that must be made more public and dealt with and rooted out right away. But in all other cases, when a person who has committed a wrong has been approached by the offended believer and they don't listen, Jesus gave three additional strategies or three additional steps. He says, take two or three witnesses. And he would have in mind to take two discerning, non-biased, faithful people who patiently seek to know the truth and to draw everybody involved into a deeper, a deeper relationship with God and his healing. To use persuasion, to take your time, to take a lot of time to see this through without, again, involving the larger community, without spreading the news around. But even if the offending person doesn't want to admit they're wrong there, there's stage three. Again, first is the individual approaching, 
Secondly, it was the individual plus two or three witnesses. And three is to involve the church itself. This is where the larger community gets involved in a structured way, maybe through its leadership or maybe a committee that is shaped for this purpose. And you know, Jesus is prescribing a lot of work here over one person. And this is a lot of tough work. And we don't see this anywhere else in life in this world that such care and attention, such desire is laid out for calling one person to turn away from their selfish acts because it matters that much to God. Again, this is not to win a battle, but to win back a soul that has been bent on itself, to win someone back to God who has wandered away, someone who's lost in their own understanding. Well, there's a, a final strategy that Jesus gave if those three don't work. And it's this, if they don't listen to the individual who is hurt, if they don't listen to the two or three witnesses, if they don't listen to the resources of the gathered church and the patience and time that has been used, then sadly, with grief, you stop treating that person as though they're a part of that community. And this is really, really hard. It takes a long, long time to get to this point a lot of sustained effort and a lot of, lot of love and thought. A lot of humility, a lot of inner reflection has to take place. But in the end, there is no coercion to change a heart. You can't legislate it. You can't make it happen. A person who has sinned and has been approached in these ways must ultimately want it. They must want to change. They must want forgiveness. Jesus said, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. So in, that, in their day, tax collectors were often Jewish people who decided to walk outside of the family of faith to take advantage of their own people, to cause harm and disrepute in an ongoing, sustained way. And they stayed connected in some way with the community. They stayed connected, but they weren't really of the community. And Jesus says to treat that person like that. But you have to remember, and I'm, <laughs> you have to remember, God doesn't give up on that person either. Now, you know who knows that better than most? It's Matthew who wrote this testimony to begin with. He wrote this book that we find our passage. He was a tax collector who spurned fellowship with God's people. He caused harm to God's people. He betrayed God's people. But ultimately, he was won back by God through God's people and in the power of God's word. So even to the worst of all people, God seeks and yearns for his kingdom to be filled to the brim with forgiven, redeemed sinners. And that involves every single one of us. Now, earlier I shared two parables of Jesus, the shepherd who leaves the 99 for the one and the woman who scours her home for the lost coin. Now, he said these two parables to religious leaders who grumbled that Jesus was associating with the worst of all people, the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus used those two parables because he was seen to be enjoying his time and reaching out to those who seemed the most lost, the worst of all people. Why? Because God always yearns for people. He bears incredible pain and loss to reach out to those that he loves so much, all the way to death, even death on a cross. So my friends, when we are dealing with sin in the church, when we have been sinned against us, it is so important to pause, to reflect, to understand our emotions, to seek out help, but then to respond and approach the person who has sinned against you with the ultimate hope of Jesus Christ's hope, which is to win them into his kingdom. Amen.